This time around, I'm going to be showing the program monitor, which exists up here. By the way, I want to kind of re-emphasize throughout each one of these tutorials that you can hold your mouse over a specific window, any one of these windows, and hit the tilde key above your tab, a little squiggly key above your tab, and you can go full screen. I'm going to bring this full screen so I can kind of talk about the program window. What the program window essentially is, is it displays, it's very similar to the source monitor. Uh, the source monitor is a viewer for individual clips whereas the program monitor is a viewer for the timeline. This specifically up here, this specifically represents the timeline and will display the exact frame where the playhead has been placed. Here, right now we're at 33 seconds and 15 frames into the timeline, we are displaying this frame. Now, we do have this window selected here. Shift 4 is how you get to this window. If you do Shift 1, 2, 3, 4, you notice it gets highlighted. And now if I tilt it over this, it will go full screen. Well, nearly full screen. It's almost full screen. Uh, by the way, if you want one kind of cool little shortcut, if you're viewing dailies out of Premiere and you want to watch shot after shot after shot, is you can simply, I'm muting my audio here, you can simply do, instead of tilde, you can hold your mouse over this and do control tilde. Actually, I believe you can do it with your mouse anywhere on the screen. Yeah, and it will go control tilde will actually make this go full screen, absolute full screen, so it takes over your entire screen. And then you can press play and playback video footage uh, full screen. And this is a good way to view dailies. If you put a whole bunch of your clips into your timeline, you can hit uh, control tilde to toggle in and out of that. So that's one cool little feature there. Um, but once again, this window displays wherever your playhead is. So if I grab my playhead and move it across here, you're going to see that updating up in your program monitor. It will display the exact frame that you have your playhead over up in this window. So all your editing, your movie, this is going to be your final edited movie up here. Uh, that you're editing down in your timeline. First of all, you, have, you do have this little mini playhead right here that coincides. You notice that that is linked with the video playhead down below. So this is basically, this little area right here is essentially a repeat of, of your, kind of a, almost like a mini timeline showing from beginning to end. It just doesn't show the clips. You just grab your playhead and you can move it back and forth like so. Now you do have a little zoom tool up here. If you want to get closer to frames here, you can grab your little edge and pull this and then it will start to show as you get closer and closer, we'll start to break this up into incre increments. If you zoom in all the way, it'll show each one of these little tick marks is an individual frame. You can see as your playhead goes through, it goes through frame by frame by frame. And as you get to the end here, I'm going to arrow back. I'm arrowing backwards frame by frame. As you get back, it suddenly resets to the middle, and now these frame ticks belong to the next segment of the video. So either way you go here, it's going to show that. And then you can grab this and zoom back out and show kind of the entire timeline. And this gets so zoomed out that these will, these ticks will no longer be individual frames. These will be an incremental. I'm not sure how long that period would be there from one point to the next, but as you zoom up close enough, you'll get to individual frames. Now, the same rules apply up here as apply in the timeline and the source monitor. You press your space bar to play, your space bar to pause, and you'll see these little buttons here activate here. That's your play button. You can click on that as well, but that's just space bar to play and space bar to pause. You can use your JKL keys. J is rewind. K is stop, L is forward. Then if you hit J a bunch of times, it will start rewinding faster and faster. As you hit L a bunch of times, it will forward faster and faster. And you'll see your playhead moving at faster speeds as you do that. Up here, you have your time code for your timeline. It shows where you're at. Right here, you'll see this one and this one. They're always going to be exactly, exactly the same. Your timeline time code is the same as your program time code, since your program is just basically displaying everything in your timeline. Right here, this is something they've added to 2015. Uh, this is uh, this shows right now I got a lot of frames dropped because I am um, I am recording while I'm playing, but this will indicate how many frames you play you dropped. Basically you notice as it stutters here, it's stuttering because I'm having issues playing back because my video card is not good enough to support both screen recording and playing back video, but if I hover this over, it will show how many frames you drop. Watch this as I fast forward, and I stop, and I hover over this. It's going to show 355 fra frames during the duration of that clip that I just showed there were dropped, and I did not actually see that many. Uh, you won't usually have this issue on your on a regular computer. You won't see as many frames dropped unless you're playing really high quality footage, but this is kind of nice to show that you are actually dropping frames. And you just basically hover over that, and it will show how many frames were dropped during the last playback. 
this next little drop down menu here. This is your zoom on your image here. You can tell it to zoom up on your image by pulling this down and saying, let's show 400%, and it's going to zoom up to 400%. We can tell this to show 10% and it will zoom out to 10% of your image. You can tell this to fit and it will fit back in your screen. Where this will become really important is when you start doing compositing because you can start doing things like this. I'm going to double click in the image right here. We'll get into a more, more in our compositing episode and upcoming episodes. We'll show how this works. But I double click on the image. It creates a wireframe. Notice if you want to scale this and shrink it down. And now let me pull this out and say let's go to 25%. You'll notice you got this lighter dark area out here and the black area in here. This black area represents your television set. That is the image that it is deciding to leave into the shot. Out here is kind of the null area that's not real. It's a really non-existent area where your signal doesn't exist. You can actually, when you're doing compositing, you move these out and you'll still see the wireframe of the video over here, but it's not being displayed on screen. This way you can do some animations of things coming on screen. But this is kind of nice to be able to zoom out because then you can see your wireframe off screen here and you can move it on the screen if you're doing some animations, which we'll get into. But this is your wireframe here. You'll have access to rotate. You'll have access to scale, to position, and basically rotation as well as you take it around the corner here. Right there you've got a rotation as well. You'll have uh, access to the basic attributes on your wireframe in your program monitor. Over here, this drop down menu is uh, very much the same as the source monitor. You'll pull this down and if you're playing back uh, footage that's 4K or higher or red footage or Alexa footage and stuff that is having a difficult time keeping up with, you can change your resolution. It is very common to turn the resolution down to quarter for red footage or Alexa footage so your footage will, will play back full time and it makes you able to edit a feature film shot on something like a red and Alexa camera. You can edit on a laptop essentially by turning this resolution down. It is not changing the quality of your clip, it's just changing it while you play back. And then when you're done playing back, when you pause, it displays full quality. With DSLR footage, you can normally pretty much put this on full, and it will be able to keep back up with it and play back full quality DSLR footage just fine. Down here along the bottom, you have your add marker, which is also your shortcut. If you're operating within this window here, you can just hit M, and it will add a marker. Since it's added here, it's going to be added on your timeline since this is a di direct reflection of your timeline here. So you can add markers and add notes to your timeline or to clips in your timeline just by simply adding the marker. You can add, and this is going to be very important in future episodes when we talk about, that's my like mantra that I've been going off by as we'll show this in future episodes, which we will, but you can add in and out points to your timeline. I hit I there and O there for your shortcut, or you can hit these keys, in point, out point, to add markers, in points and out points onto your timeline, which will be important for editing. And like I said, we will show that in future episodes. Once you have an endpoint and outpoint set, this is very similar to the source monitor. You have a jump to endpoint and a jump to outpoint key over here. It's Shift I for shortcut and Shift O for shortcuts to jump. So Shift I goes to your endpoint, Shift O goes to your outpoint. You have your step back one frame at a time and step forward one frame at a time, which you can also do with your arrows left and right keys. Now one thing that I want to point out while you're in this window, this is kind of strange the way this works, if you're not in your, if you're in your timeline you can use your arrows left and right to step through the frame. If you are in your program window and you use your arrows left and right it will still go through frame by frame just as you're seeing here but you got to be careful if you have your clip selected up here and you have that wireframe up and you do arrows left and right you'll notice every time I hit left it moves this image to the left one pixel. If I do shift, arrow left, it does it five pixels at a time. And if you use arrows up and down, it does the same thing, moves it up or moves your image down. That's just while the wireframe is active. If it's not active, it has normal functionality like it does in the timeline. Arrow left goes one frame at a time. Arrow right goes one frame at a time. Arrow up jumps to the previous edit. Arrow down jumps to the next edit. So very similar to the timeline. And it's actually controlling the timeline. Over here on the side, this is your in and out point duration or the duration of your timeline. Right now I've got the in and out duration, that's 44 seconds and 8 frames. If I clear that, Option X, or I believe it's Control Shift X on the, on the PC, will clear your in and out points. And now that's the duration of the timeline. Down here at the bottom, you have your lift and, and extract keys. This is for trimming down in your timeline here. This is kind of similar to your insert and overwrite in your source monitor, but it does it in the timeline. Watch what happens as I select this clip here. This is almost like the opposite. Instead of placing it in the timeline, these items up here and these shortcuts remove things from the timeline. And you have to do this with an in and out point. So if we set an I point or an O point, in point or out point of this range here, and we hit our lift button or we hit semicolon, 
it will extract that. That's basically like a cut. It just cut that section out of the timeline. I'm going to undo that. And actually, you can paste that. After you do the extraction, you can do Command-V and paste, and it will paste that selection from wherever your playhead is. So I'm going to undo that. Now I'm going to show you the difference between lift and extract. Extract, watch what happens when you hit extract, or the quotation key on your keyboard. They're right next to each other. you got the semicolon and the quotation key. I'm going to hit that, and notice it cut that out, and it fills the gap. So it extracts it and fills that gap. So that's called an extract. A lift will take it out without filling the gap. There's the lift. Undo. There's the extract. Similar to the source monitor, you also have the export frame. You can get this on an exact frame, and you can export a still image of this clip right here. So I've got that kind of moved over. Let me clear the... I'm going to clear, clear my effects so it goes back to normal. Now say I want to export out the frame. You can click here. You can choose what format you want it in out of these five different formats, DPX, JP, JPEG, PNG, Target, and TIFF. You can browse and tell it where to save that. You can name it here, and it will save that still image to that location. After it's done, it will also import that JPEG into your project if you have this check mark. Otherwise, if you need to email out the JPEG, you can save it on your desktop or wherever you wish, and then email it off. Also similar to the source monitor is this button editor. You click on this and you can add specific shortcuts if you have some missing. If you're doing multi-camera record and some other things, you can add these icons down here for quick access. Anything you click on, you can tell it. You can just drag these down and tell it where to position them, then hit OK. So if I want to add my record button here for multi-camera, I can just drag that, drop it, hit OK, and now that button has been added. I'm going to reset that back to normal and hit OK. And lastly, we have the settings for this monitor here. And we will get into some of these items in future episodes when you're doing uh, compositing. You might need to show alpha channel. You might need to show multi-camera. And we'll have a multi-camera episode which will demonstrate this. So this, you will use these drop-down menus here to show the alpha channel or the multi-camera setup. You have playback resolution, which is also in the drop-down menu. So that's a little redundant there. Pause resolution is by default is usually always on full quality. Uh, you can tell it to show the time code overlay during the edit. You can have that displayed up here. And there's a whole bunch of other things here which we're not necessarily going to get into deep. But uh, also the overlays, which we also demonstrated in the source monitor. You can tell it to show specific overlays on the window here, like time code. And that's basically, it's not burned in when you export it out, but it will be burned in while you're playing. So I'm going to uncheck that. You can also go into the overlay settings and tell it what specific settings to display by going up to settings and changing what items and I'd say just experiment with this and see what sort of things it can display. But the, these are very uh, seldom used unless you need to see time code while the clip is playing. So that's it for this episode. Next episode I will be getting into finally showing you how uh, to do basic editing, how to get a clip from here to your source monitor, choosing what part of, portion of that clip you wish, and putting it in your timeline. And then in future episodes we'll show you how to trim in your timeline, and we'll, show, we'll demonstrate also the toolbar and get into the all the settings of the toolbar and what these items do over on this side.